Thank you. And thanks everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules, to, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, nonetheless, to find time to learn a bit. So hopefully we can uh, go through this and take away some tidbits and tricks that you can apply immediately. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I was born and raised in New York City. I went to Ross University for vet school, graduating in 2004. I have a lifelong passion for learning. So after vet school, I then got rehab certified through the University of Tennessee in 2008. That's the CCRP program. And then realizing that I need to learn more about pain management, I got certified in that through the IVAPM and in acupuncture through the Chi Institute. Uh, I'm a member of the International Rehab Society, the IVRPT, because rehab and pain is not just isolated to North America. And in 2014, I went back and did the career path way for the ACVSMR, the American College of Veterinary Sports Med and Rehabilitation. And I'm now a diplomat at that college and I'm the medical director for Veterinary Surgical Centers Rehabilitation in Northern Virginia. Uh, so my whole focus now, having started in mixed animal practice right out of school, is now exclusively in small animal pain management, although I'll still help anywhere and everywhere where we can. Um, I've done some shelter work as well. I've done some high volume spay and neuter along the way in my career. So I try to blend a lot of things together when we talk about pain, pandemic or not. You know, if you look up the Webster's Dictionary definition of pain, that's the first bullet that I won't bore you with, but I'd rather think about it as an obligation for us as practitioners to pain. And that is to advocate on behalf of beings who cannot advocate for themselves. You know, every single patient that comes through in every facet of veterinary healthcare is gonna experience pain at some point in its life. And it's our job as doctors, technicians, assistants, et cetera, is to work as that team to help identify it and help to treat it. And that's what we're gonna work through here in this presentation. Now I would ask, which one of these do you think is more painful? Is it the grumpy Scotty or is it this Latinx? You know, some people might look at the grumpy Scotty and go, well, he's just grumpy because he's a terrier. You know, it's hard to say sometimes. Our patients are nonverbal and we have to be better about how, we, how to listen and understand their clues and cues that they're giving us. To take other two examples, who thinks here the little terrier on the left is more painful or the dog on the right? Would your mind change if I told you that the terrier was trained to smile for the camera? That's actually his smile face. The Labrador is kind of sitting there. You could think of two things, right? Either you hold something really tasty in your hands right now that that Labrador wants and is giving you the sad eyes, or that's actually a lab with two partially torn cruciates that I saw a while back. So you have to really understand how to look and see these kids and what's going on. And then the easy ones, right? You know, may not see this in shelters, maybe we do, the wild things that could come in, but porcupine quills, right? The easy ones. So sometimes pain is really obvious, sometimes it's not. Just as a brief review, it may have been a while since we all went through vet school, just remember that analgesia is the insensibility to perceive pain without losing consciousness. So analgesics are things like NSAIDs. Anesthetics is just the loss of feeling, but not the loss of pain perception. So isoflurane is an anesthetic, it's not an analgesic. Sedation, we're just relaxed and happy, but we're not pain relieving necessarily with a sedative. Ace promazine is a sedative, it is in no way an analgesic. When we talk about multimodal, we talk about this a lot, you know, multimodal approach to arthritis, multimodal approach to pain, we're attacking different pathways with different mechanisms at the same time. And we wanna be preemptive in our analgesic because we wanna plan ahead of time because what we want to avoid are things that are either hyper aesthetic, so pathologically oversensitive to a painful stimuli or allodynic. And allodynia is one of the harder ones because it's when we just brush or pet the pet lightly and it tries to bite you. Is that because it's stressed or scared or because it's actually way oversensitized to something painful. Types of pain, timing comes into importance with this. I mean, we may see things 
in a shelter environment that had been chronic, because that's when they finally got captured and could come in um, or got surrendered and they've been dealing with it for a while. Or you may deal with stuff that is more acute in its onset. Pain also happens from chronicity and can happen from different parts of the body as well. And just remember too, we're gonna to focus a lot on you know, arthritic pain and, and mobility pain, but visceral pain is important. Pyometrias hurt, GDVs hurt, glaucomas hurt. You know, these are things that we can work on and help with so that we avoid those neuropathic pains or those cancer pains. You may see that in shelter medicine as well. I realize it's now October and maybe if you're watching this on a um, recording, it may even be November. Um, to me, while well, September is Animal Pain Awareness Month through the IVAPM, every month we should be aware of animals' pain. So these are flyers that we used to have in our exam rooms when we had these strange things called clients that used to come into our exam rooms. Now that we've done curbside for the better part of nine months, we actually email these to our owners to remind them to think about pain at home. So something to do in the clinic as well for your new assistants or folks that may not be as medically trained, clue them in, right? They're not going up and down the stairs. The pets aren't jumping up on surfaces. Their appetite isn't off. Maybe they're over grooming or licking a particular area. Um, I had a dog, we've had a bunch of dogs that will cause lick granulomas. And I've had a bunch of lick granulomas over arthritic joints. I actually had a dog once had a lick granuloma that they came in and the dog actually had an osteosarcoma underneath it. So the animals are telling us stuff. We just have to be better about how to listen and observe. Those signs of pain, there's, there's hundreds. I'm not gonna bore you guys with going through word by word on these, but just be aware and be advocating that anything that could be out there from hiding to biting could be pain. We can put some harder numbers on things in pain, right? We can say, well, they're tachycardic or they're tachypnic, whether they're awake or under anesthesia. Maybe they're hypertensive. And in a surgical environment, our inclination is to turn up the gas, right? Well, that we're just turning up the anesthetic. We're not doing anything for the analgesia. The pet's holding still, or the animal's holding still, it's easier for us as a surgical team, but we're not actually doing anything for its analgesia and potentially we're just dialing up its hypotension. So we really wanna be better advocates of pain and knowing to use analgesics and not anesthetics for. From my world, when we think about mobility, I'm looking for things like muscle atrophy, how they flex and extend elbows, how they extend their hips. Do they have effusion in their joints? You know, an effusion can be tricky to find, but the ways that I think about it is if you feel every joint on every patient, you'll know your normals and then your abnormals stick out. So if you feel your own knees right now, if you feel your own kneecaps and come down and feel your own patella tendons, on either side of your patella tendon should be a concave depression. That's because your knee is not effused. If it's flat or convex, that stifle is effused. Now, I don't know if that's a cruciate tear or a meniscal injury or something else in a dog, a cat, or a person, but it needs to be investigated. And the same thing about finding a fusion in the tarsi or the elbows, right? You should feel these bony prominences. And if all you feel is this big bag of fluid, you know something's not right there. Our best tool is our physical exam to do that, because then we can start to identify the causes. We may see any of these in any type of environment in veterinary medicine, you know, but we can now start to think about how do we approach those? How can we plan for those ahead of time? Because it's when we don't plan that we run into trouble and the potential for pain is everywhere. These we use a lot because now that we understand the science of pain, we need to know how to grade it. And this is probably my favorite go-to one. There's a lot of different pain scales out there, but the Colorado State Vet school came up with a validated system for both dogs and separately for cats and an acute and a chronic scale. And these you can go in and download and print in your clinic, the same as those IVAPM pain awareness handouts. And we laminate these and we put these in the rewards and the cages and the runs so that we can just look at it as a quick reference. You know, it's got a picture, it's got 
what we should be looking for from a behavioral observational standpoint. We should, it gives us some clues as to what we should be doing when we're palpating, what we should be feeling. And what I really like about it the most is anytime the pain gets above a two here out of four, it reminds us to uh, reassess that analgesic plan because it's probably not working as much as it should be. We want to keep pain to a zero or a one at best. Other ways to appreciate pain is through the face. And this was actually a validated study. And I want to spend a minute here for our cats because our cats kind of get overlooked. Um, you know, usually these two cats, if you were to think about, would be more painful. One just bugging out or freaking out that there's a dog there. Or is one vocalizing and look at literally the cat on the left going, ow. So this is what's called the feline grimace scale. Uh, this is a research paper done that looked at lots of cats and looked at eye position, distance between the eyes and the ears and the muzzle, whisker position, uh, size of the pupil, ear position, and really understanding and quantifying pain in cats. And it scored each area, there's five areas, um, each got a score of zero, one, or two. And you can see these here a bit, whisker position and head position. And those kind of fit. Look at the pictures on the cat on the left. The cat's just looking at you in the shelter, right? Why are you staring at me? Uh, versus the cat all the way on the right who has a raging sense of pain, right? His eyes are closed, his ears are flipped over, his whiskers are in a different position, his head's down. So this is another one that you could laminate and put up, and it's an easy one for people to start understanding and referring to. And this is just that summary. Again, they did a really good thing here that zero, one, or two for those five different things and anything with a cumulative score greater than four, reassess your analgesic plan. If we know the signs of pain and how to score it, now we move into management. And for me, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on mobility, whether that's ortho or neuro, and what you find in pain and mobility is a lot of my practice. And I think that's a helpful way to look at it in a shelter environment as well. How many of these dogs are fat? How many of these cats are fat? So deal with obesity. Try to plug along with where you can, figure out what's going on there. You know, we know that by doing that, we're gonna reduce the load and stress on the joints. They need to be active. They can lose weight even if they're in your shelter and they're not as active, you don't know, have a ton of walking capabilities. Adjusting for that. I always remind owners when they adopt a pet or if they're just coming in to see me in the clinic, but the back of that bag of dog food is designed for an animal that has their sexual organs. And the day they lose their sexual organs, a patient's caloric requirements drop by 25 to 33%. So it's not that the back of the bag is designing to oversell dog food. It's the way the AFCO statements and the AFCO map is set up that they're designed to be for sexually intact animals. So check into those things. Those are easy things to start to look at because otherwise you wind up with cases like this. This is a 57 pound dachshund that I saw last year. It came in to see me as a down dog. I'm not a neurologist, but I do see anybody that doesn't walk well and they didn't want to see neuro, but they didn't know what was going on. And the honest answer was, was that this dog was musculoskeletally and neurologically completely normal. His cardiovascular system was normal as well. Literally, this dog could not stand because of his weight. They were feeding this dog over 2,000 calories a day, and his walks were putting him in his Oscar Mayer Wiener mobile, because he's a little dachshund, and walking him around the block. So this dog never walked. We ran blood work. We started to do calorie math. Thankfully, there was nothing else metabolically wrong with this kid, and he's losing weight simply through a diet and some exercise. Right? Didn't need major surgery, didn't need an MRI, just tackle obesity. And here's why. Here's a study that came out of JVIM about a year and a half ago that they looked at 50,000 50, dogs and said, are you fat or are you lean body weight? And then how long do you live? And you can see the summaries of that right there. And so I turned to these owners, I said, if you're a fat dachshund, you're going to live two and a third years less on average as compared to lean dachshunds. Look at these other breeds that were out there. Right? It's a life-shortening disease. So if they're with you for a short time or a long time in a shelter environment, 
I need veterinary care. This is where we need to be good advocates. Because that obesity is a twofold problem. We can all go, okay, yeah, the dog was too fat, it couldn't even stand. Sure, that's the macroscopic level. On a microscopic level, all that fat secretes pro-inflammatory mediators that then further degrade cartilage. So on a microscopic level, fat is dangerous to mobility. Moving from that, how do we actually treat some of the pain? For mobility pain, I still reach for NSAIDs first and second. Right? It still is our go-to. We then want to get them into rehab therapy. We'll talk about a couple other little drugs along the way. An environment, whether it's at home or in the clinic, simple things, right? Providing traction, making sure they have good thick blankets and bed, big beds to lay on. Being aware that in a clinic setting, do we have some downtime where the bright lights aren't on and there's not a lot of noise that can actually sleep and rest? You know, what can we do to modify some things at home? But like I said, my first and foremost for arthritic mobility pain is still an NSAID because it's gonna work best. Right? We're gonna see results hopefully in 24 to 48 hours. I don't endorse any particular brand. There's all sorts of things out there. They do help, right? But what happens when they can't do that? or we need other things, or their liver doesn't work right. What else can we do? These are the adjunct medications. They're not designed to be primary OA treaters, but they can help along the way. And amantadine is actually the only one that we have a paper on that actually backs up the claim. Amantadine has a paper out of NC State's vet school. And now going back 12 years, it actually showed in conjunction with an NSAID, amantadine can help in the long-term care of arthritis. Gabapentin, we all love. We use it for fear-free techniques. We use it for all sorts of things. The number of papers on efficacy for gabapentin for OA pain relief is zero. Okay? It's anecdotal. I'm not saying it doesn't work, but I'm saying we could use a little bit more evidence-based medicine. So it's there, but don't rely on it as a sole therapy. Some other ones that we can use, we can still use Tylenol, plus or minus codeine for dogs. Coding overall opioids are not that helpful. And I don't know if I put it in here, but quick second is I also don't use tramadol because tramadol we've shown for OA pain is less effective than placebo. That paper was done out of, uh, was in JAVMA a couple of years ago by Dr. Budsberg out of the University of Georgia showing that uh, for OA pain on a force blade that literally tramadol was worse than placebo. But you can use acetaminophen alone in dogs as a rescue. You may be using gravaprant. Remember that it's still an NSAID. Um, you still have to treat it like any other NSAID. You have to get blood work ahead of time and in the course of its progress, so if you could keep it on it long term, because it does need to be given daily. It's not a PRN drug. And there are now a couple of cases of reported acute renal failure, acute kidney in incidences on the ACBIM listserv. So it takes a while to take effect. It's not a bad drug. I mean, it can be helpful for mild pain, but we need to be aware that we have to treat it like any other NSAID. Some other things I think that are cheap and easy to use for pain relief, hot and cold therapy. Whether thermal therapy through heating up things in the microwave, but just don't use an electric heating pad because the thermostats on those are not always reliable. Somebody inadvertently puts it up to high, the dog or cat stays there too long, you can induce a thermal burn. So I don't use heating pads for that, but I still use hot and cold because they have help, right? We know the heat's gonna cause vasodilation and bring blood flow to an area. So we don't want that right after an injury. We don't want that at right after surgery. We want that maybe five days later. Cold therapy right away, sure. Vasoconstricting, pain relieving, very helpful. Other things that I use to help modify pain is we're always fighting gravity. So we use things like this harness that we can leave on these dogs or there's even I have some on some cats 24 seven and it gives them built in handles for the team, wherever the caregiver team is to lift those pads but it doesn't restrict shoulder motion or anything else and it supports their pelvis. And then what I also use a lot is what's called pulsed electromagnetic field therapies. So PEMF, kind of looks like an old TV antenna for those of you who remember those. 
and it's an electromagnet. And you're like, uh oh, is this going to be as dangerous as a cell phone? It's actually safer than a thousand cell phone batteries. Um, and specifically, we get into targeted pulsed electromagnetic field devices. And the mechanism of an action with these is that we're going to enhance nitric oxide signaling. And that's what the body uses to combat inflammation. So basically, with a PMF device, we're doing a non pharmaceutical anti inflammatory. That's going to then lead to an increase in blood flow and a reduction of pain and inflammation. And that nitric oxide also modulates cytokines and growth factors. So we actually get accelerated wound healing and tissue repair. What does that device look like? There's a couple of different ones on the market and they're all individual. You really need to look and see what's got, who's got the research on their device because the wavelengths um, and the, spec, the specifics of each one are different and they're not interchangeable one for the other. The loop device, they have the battery here on the right side. Um, and then the loop itself is what is emitting the wave. And it winds up looking like a whipworm egg. And it'll emit it in both directions. Treatment times are about 15 minutes. They can be every two to four hours in the acute settings in the clinic. Or they can be done every four to 24 hours at home. They will penetrate through bandages and casting material and bedding. So that's really helpful. The areas that we have to be, can't be on or as much are using it over any patient with a pacemaker and we don't want to use it in a metal cage because it's an electromagnet. So benefits are we're going to decrease pain and inflammation, we're going to accelerate wound repair and it's been FDA approved for this. The device has actually been shown originally for humans going through breast cancer surgery, decreasing their pain and inflammation and reducing scar tissue formation and better flexibility. So you can do it as a loop where we've got it over this dog's painful area here just below his knee as he's finishing up. Um, he was recovering from an injury. And then this is my own dog because they now make these as bed devices. So we could slide the whole thing underneath as she's recovering. I actually got her from a shelter earlier this year. She had come in with bilateral distal femoral physeal fractures that were left untreated for about a month. Um, and so I actually wound up adopting her and we're in the process of realigning her femurs. And so we use targeted pulse electromagnetic field therapy because it's not going to emit a sound or, or a light or anything like that, but it's going to decrease that inflammation as her bones are growing and it's safe to use over those. What's the research on it though, right? I've talked a lot about evidence-based medicine here. Here's a paper out of Animal Medical Center looking at using these devices after hemilaminectomies. And you can pull these papers up. It showed that they needed less opioids and had better incision scores than the control group did. And another paper that was looking at the recovery of pain, of reducing pain and improving local motor function, also following intervertebral disc extrusions. So we got the papers now to back these up and to use them in different areas of our pain management. And I like them because you can use them over implants. You can use them, as we said in the humans, they were originally done over breast cancer surgical sites. So we can use them over oncological patients as well. We can use them at home. We can use them in the clinic. I can have owners do it because especially in a COVID pandemic, you can't have everything come in as much. Maybe we have limited time. Maybe we have in a shelter environment. Maybe we have more fosters and pets staying at foster homes. So this is something the fosters can do at home because all they have to do is lay it on the patient for its 15 minutes a couple of times a day. The loops client cost come out to about $2 or so a treatment. The rechargeable beds come out to about 25 cents a treatment. So what I always say is if you're gonna try it, because it doesn't work on everybody, right? But if it works, then instead of getting three or four loops, go get a bed. It'll be a little bit better an option. I also use this in environments, our surgical team uses them at home for patients that have had uh, degloving injuries or other wounds that we're trying to get accelerating to heal can be really beneficial. With that, here's my direct contact info. I'd like to thank the folks at CZ Animal Health for having me with you guys today, and we'll open it up to any questions.